This is another eye raw podcast. <coughs> yes, we have barely asked the questions. What do they want? What kind of relationships they want with us? What they want to do in their daily life? What kind of relationships they want to build with one another? And whether they want to stay in our relationship with us and contribute or not do something completely different. So we don't ask the animals themselves what they want. Uh, hi, welcome back to the Animal Turn for episode eight. Before we get fully into the episode, I just wanted to say that I was very sad to see this week that Ontario had passed Bill 156. This despite similar bills having recently been struck down in U.S. states like Idaho and Utah. Um, after having spoken to Siobhan O'Sullivan about ag-gag laws, I can now appreciate more how this law is not only an assault on animals, but also on questions of freedom of expression and how this fundamentally curtails opportunities for whistleblowers to tell us about abhorrent conditions. Uh, of course, how this will manifest in Canada could be very different, as we saw it's different in Australia versus in the US. But I think in general, this is a real big blow. Um, you know, it's been opposed now by numerous groups in Canada, including the Canadian Journalists for Free Expression, as well as several animal rights groups such as Animal Justice. Uh, while there's certainly a lot of exciting and interesting thoughts happening in academia about animals and the law and how we can think about animals and the law, it is really disheartening to see Canada continue to operate in the best interests of industries that are harmful for our planet, people and animals. Uh, this has clearly been laid bare by COVID-19, which has just really shown how some of these industries are just awful. Um in the next two episodes, so episode eight and episode nine, what I'm hoping to do is kind of switch thinking about what laws do exist and what kind of concepts with legal concepts we currently have to thinking more aspirationally. What kind of world do we want to imagine? Uh, of course, we want to imagine a world in which these agag laws do not exist, uh, but maybe we should also start thinking a bit more aspirationally and today's speaker will help me a bit with that or help us a bit with that uh, so I'm going to be speaking to Frédéric Cotter-Baudeau uh, he did try and train me a bit on how to say his name uh, but chances are I didn't quite get it right so I'm really really sorry uh, I need to brush up a bit on my French uh, so today I'm speaking to him about autonomy a concept that is fraught with tension and complication uh, it's not as easy as it first appears and Frederick raises really important questions about how we should think not only about how animals suffer but also about how they might choose to live uh, and this is where the aspirational component comes in. While we don't get too deep into considering what the legal implications are of this, I think it cracks open a really, you know, a really difficult and interesting legal and practical considerations. What would our society look like if it wasn't only based on the autonomy of humans, or at least some humans, right? Um, you know, not all humans have equal space and right to make their decisions but what would it look like if we started to complicate autonomy by considering the ideas and the wants and the desires of animals too so i'm going to leave that with you to mull over and think through while we go through episode eight with frederick to try and think aspirationally about the law and what it could potentially do in future uh, before we get straight into the episode, uh, I just also wanted to point out that there were one or two um, sound issues. You will hear some jingling throughout the episode. Uh, we tried to figure out what that was. It sounds a bit like a bangle, um, but it wasn't. So we, we sat trying to figure it out, but we couldn't. So it's not that terrible. I just wanted to give you a heads up so that it doesn't jar you throughout. Just consider it an early uh, Christmas bell, if you will. And then... Lastly, you will also notice that I'm speaking slightly slower than what is my usual um, momentum. And maybe for some of you, this will be a welcome relief because I know that I can really brrr 
when I when I want to, but I am speaking a bit slower because uh, Frederic is actually a, a second language speaker um, or a second language English speaker. So uh, I was just trying to make sure that uh, I'm fully understood and comprehended. Uh, and you can't really tell like uh, he's he's amazing and we have an incredible conversation. So I hope that you enjoy it and that it gives you some some sort of interesting inroads to thinking about animals and the law. It's so lovely to chat with you today. Thank you for joining me on The Animal Turn. Uh, I always like to start off the episode by uh, giving you an opportunity to say, how did you come to be interested in animal studies and animal study scholarship? Yes. So, uh, well, first, it's a pleasure for me for being here. I'm also a listener to your podcast. So it's really a, an honor for me to be invited. And uh, to reply to your question, I guess it was in the middle of my undergrad studies. I just came across a really short text about animal ethics that it really got my attention. And from then, I just started to read more and more about a topic and eventually decided to do my MA research on this issue. Um, and it, it led eventually to my PhD thesis as well. And what, what was your PhD thesis on? So I worked on the concept of autonomy that I tried to, um, uh, to grant to non-human animals as well as uh, persons with cognitive disabilities. Autonomy. And you did that at Queen's University, correct? Yes, exactly. Hey, my home university. Yes, that's wonderful. <laughs> So you said that your PhD is on autonomy, which is going to be our focus for today. And when I was getting ready for today's episode, I actually, I, I tried to think more about autonomy and what it is. And it seems as though it's actually a really complicated concept. Could you maybe give me just a kind of brief overview of what you think autonomy is? Yes, so the way I tackled the concept of autonomy was rather to look at its function. How does it work? How does it operate at the moment in our societies? And what I think it does, at least uh, a lot of times, is that it kind of captures a right for a person to be protected from um, outside influence, outside interferences. So we're trying to say that the life of that person belongs to her. And she has the right to decide to in which direction her life her life can go, what she's allowed to do or to refuse. Um, I think that's really the function of autonomy. So I was that was what I was interested in. What so, the, the, the uh, translate into animals as well? So autonomy autonomy is your right to make a decision for yourself. Exactly. Uh, sometimes I phrase it as the right to make personal choices. And how does this relate to the law? Like, does the law protect my right to make my own choices? Uh, well, I'm not a legal scholar, but yes, I do have the impression that there are limits to what the law can force you to do because there are some things that are just uh, considered to be personal. So it's not a state to dictate what you must believe in, what you should do, except respecting the rights of others, for instance. Of, and of course, you should contribute to the extent possible to the rest of the society. But how you direct your own personal life, that's up to you, it's not up to the state. So we do have a lot of laws protecting those individuals, uh, citizens, to not see state interference in their personal life. So would you say that autonomy and free will are, are they one and the same or is there any sort of difference between them? I think generally freedom of the will is perhaps more taking as a metaphysical concept. Uh, so uh, an autonomy, I really take it as a political and legal concept. So regarding the metaphysical issue is uh, whether or not we have free will is, is really to the question of um, uh, whether all things, uh, deterministic issues about uh, whether laws of science dictate all of our behavior. And I think whether or not that's true, and I personally belong to the side that probably we're all determined by uh, laws of sciences and physics and so on and psychology, but that's not relevant to whether or not we have that political right to make our personal decisions. 
Okay, so so if autonomy is a political, could are there any specific laws that you could maybe help to make this, um, I guess, more tangible? Are there specific laws that would protect? So I'm guessing like freedom of speech is uh, a law that would protect my autonomy to say whatever it is I want to say. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's a good example. It's also easy to think of uh, you have the freedom to decide with whom you're going to build relationships with. Uh, who you're going to marry, if you want to marry or not. Uh, you even don't have to marry. That's also up to you. Uh, what you're going to do with your own life, what kind of uh, career you would like to pursue, and so on. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I'm getting a sense now of it as a, a political concept, and, 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 and I'm also seeing the ways in which the state could choose to enable your autonomy or you know, take some of your autonomy away. And obviously mm-hmm. a very... A very controversial one that pertains to humans would be the idea of abortion, right? The the extent to which you can choose what to do or not to do with your body. Uh, yeah, does that is that yes. kind of correct? I think in terms of abortion, it's often framed by some feminists as a bodily autonomy. So mm-hmm. you, uh, your body belongs to you. Uh, so it's not up to other people to decide what you can do or not do with your own body. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so there are multiple layers to autonomy. So how then, you know, when thinking about autonomy in animals, I think it's it's a pretty difficult tension. A lot of people might not think that animals have autonomy. You know, uh, animals, what what agency or choice do do animals really have? They're just, uh, you know, I mean, I don't think this, but there are certainly arguments that they are just things that follow instincts and that there is no real life choice there it's just going according to instinct uh what what do you think about those types of arguments yeah i think you're right that uh, for most people the idea of animal autonomy doesn't make sense because we do have a very um uh, poor understanding or we, we grant them poor cognitive skills so they're just moving by instincts and I, I just said before that's a metaphysical take on autonomy and i think even for humans that do, wouldn't change a fact about whether or not we do have the political right. And what we do, with the kind of relationships we have with animals currently, so I just, just mentioned, a lot of people I said in this podcast, is that animals currently are treated as property. Mm-hmm. So we, we do with them basically with what we want. Uh, when we talk about autonomy now, what I'm trying to say is that we're predetermining their lo- whole life, the whole purpose of being on this earth for our own purposes. So we decide what to do with their own body, what to do with their own time, what function they're going to do for us. And we never raise the question whether they would like to do something different. Okay, so so it's almost like a negative autonomy. We take away their we take away their ability to actually have autonomy, whether it exists or not, is not even the question necessarily. It's a matter of there isn't even an opportunity for it to exist based on our current relationships. Yes, we have barely asked the questions, what do they want? What kind of relationships they want with us? What they want to do in their daily life? What kind of relationships they want to build with one another? And whether they want to stay in our relationship with us and contribute or not do something completely different so we don't ask the animals themselves what they want so i know immediately now someone's going to say that how could you ever know how how can we even ask an animal what they want Yes, absolutely. So there's a lot of epistemological uh, obstacles in determining what exactly do they want. But I think most of the time, their behavior is a good example of what things they are trying to express, where they move, whether they feel comfortable or not. This a few things we can interpret quite easily mm. uh, they're trying to tell to us, whether they're biting or screaming and so on or fleeing away. Uh, that's a good example of things they're saying they're they're refusing to do with us. Mm. But even though, though whether or not they do that kind of behavior or refusing some kind of treatments, uh, we're not even letting them having the options. I think of, oftentimes they do develop some kind of learned helplessness. It's because since they were born, they didn't have any options, any alternatives to do something differently because we decided where they're going to spend their time, especially in cages. With a lot of people, they're all crammed into cages or 
uh, very small environment, so they do did not they don't really develop the uh, the the ability to express and try to do something different to do otherwise than what is presented to them. And you think that there this is also somewhat of a, a legislative question and a political question. What what do you think? So what could we do to provide a, a more germane space for animals to have more autonomy? So I, I, I must confess my legal reflection on the, well, the legal dimensions of this issue are not well developed. So I'm not a legal scholar. So, But I, what I would say, so for sure, as many people say, uh, having them in the property paradigm does, doesn't do a lot of service to them and to, to our relationships to them. Uh, what would be the alternative? Well, we would probably, uh, if we start seeing them as persons, not only as persons that we should care for, that they are able to suffer, but as persons that we should leave them the space to make their decisions and we should solicit what are their true preferences depending on different scenarios. So that would change a lot of our public policies, what kind of resources we would provide to mm. them uh, or our responsibilities towards them. So we would need to, and, and, and I'm guessing this would look different based on the different animals, or, or not even just different species, but where those different species are located. Um, I'm guessing you would have to have different policies that are speaking to you know, animals in our cities very differently to animals in... Uh, rural areas and what their needs are, as well as how they contribute to those communities. Yes, absolutely. So these ideas were already brought forward by uh, so Donaldson and Will Kimlicka in the mm -hmm. book uh, Zoopolis. So I'm really in the same uh, kind of direction. Uh, and my own work is really focusing specifically on the issue of autonomy and just making the basic claim that their desires matter in themselves. So, and while in animal ethics, most of the time, we almost always focus on their suffering, mm -hmm. which is perfectly important. It's really something that we must do. But at the same time, it comes at a cost that we barely raise a question of what do these animals want and whether it matters or not. So I'm really just trying to make that basic claim that this question is valid and valid to the same extent that we grant uh, space for humans to decide what kind of life they would like to lead. And it's it's a it's an incredible question. And I read, thank you, you shared with me your your PhD thesis, and I had the opportunity of reading just the uh, the abstract and portions of the introduction. Mm -hmm. And it was an impressive body of work. And one thing that you did that was really interesting right in the beginning of your thesis was you actually mentioned the idea of an ableist framework as as necessary in having this conversation that we we have to be talking about the tensions between uh, or thinking about ableism when thinking mm -hmm. about animals could you per perhaps explain why you think that is so important when when thinking about autonomy yes uh, the the reason why it's so important is that the Every time you open a, a philosophy book and you start reading about autonomy, it's always about uh, the capacity to revise your own preferences. So mm -hmm. it's a metacognitive ability. You have desires about desires or you have thoughts about your own desires and you're able to sort them out to decide whether you identify with the desires you have or whether you reject them. Mm -hmm. And that's really at the core of the way autonomy is framed for human beings. The downside is, is that doesn't do justice to persons with uh, cognitive disabilities. Although most people with cognitive disabilities are for sure do have that capacity to ask themselves whether they, they, they are comfortable with their own desires, whether they reject them or uh, accept them, for sure. But there are also other people with cognitive disabilities who are not able or perhaps not very able to engage in that kind of reflection. And to me, that doesn't change a bit their right to have their own life, to decide to who to hang out with, what it, what they want to do in their daily life. Uh, it's really, for me, a fundamental right that people have, regardless of our cognitive abilities. And, and I, you know, you're right. Every time you, you open up and you start reading about these things, for when it comes to personhood, at least, when they will say, 
if we are willing to give personhood to, you know, X people, you know, then we should give it to Y animals. And a lot of people find that kind of comparison really jarring and uncomfortable. The comparison between people with cognitive disabilities and and animals, uh, as though somehow you are now collapsing and saying that these people are less than human. Yes, so the, oftentimes uh, this discussion is mostly held only within animal ethics, and we use disability as a kind of metaphor or as a case study to uh, empower the case for animals and mostly animals. Like we're barely interested in what's happening with persons with disabilities. Mm. So I'm trying to propose a different conversations in the same uh, way that the other scholars are doing recently, such as Sonora Taylor uh, mm. and a lot of other scholars uh, who are doing amazing work. And I think another way to do this is to be in solidarity. First, to pay attention to what is being done the work being done within animals uh i'm sorry within disability studies mm -hmm. and then where we're trying to make arguments not just make these arguments for the sake of non-human animals but also be mindful of how it impacts other humans as well and whether we're able to uh, put forward um, the legal and more status for all these people at the same time so what I'm trying to say here, specifically regarding autonomy, is that the way we frame autonomy for humans is already ableist. It's already rejecting the claims for people with cognitive disabilities. So it's not only harming non-human animals, it's also harming other humans as well. So you're taking it almost from, from a question of power and power dynamics, where you're saying that these are two oppressive uh, regimes or sets of relations that tend to both at the same time, reinforce and that they are shaped through each other. They they don't exist apart from one another. Well, for sure, there are a lot of meaningful differences between speciesism and uh, ableism. Um, but at the same time, they do overlap and they do share a lot of uh, at least common enemies, uh, philosophical enemies, at least. It's at least true in the case of autonomy. And it's so when I say autonomy is actually framed in terms of metacognitive abilities, the capacity to raise whether you are comfortable, whether you accept your own desires. And we also need to acknowledge it's not even clear that uh, so-called neurotypical humans, uh, so non-cognitively non impaired humans, are really that good at doing those exercises. So we have tons of studies from uh, social psychology that point out as, that suggest that even those typical humans are not very good. We're not very good at assessing whether we, we do hold those desires and whether we have control over those desires because we're just influenced by a wide range of influences that shape who we are, what kind of desires we develop. So it's not really true the picture that people uh, working on autonomy are trying to draw, that kind of the rational part mm. of, your, of yourself is what is this deciding what you were, you were going to like, what were you going to desire and so on, yeah. So there is, uh, I'm, I'm happy you, you mentioned rationality there because it was, it was kind of brewing a little bit in my mind and I know that you, you brought it up in your thesis too because it seems that the idea of the rational is what kind of stops our ability to think about ways of being in more complicated ways, uh, that we've privileged our ability to think in logical ways, when in actual fact, most of the time, as you rightfully said, we're not really thinking through what we're doing, we're just, we're doing things. How does rationality play into autonomy? I know that you ended up speaking uh, about rational agency and abilities, and then you started to say, what needs to happen in order for us to think about rational autonomy? Um, can you repeat your question exactly? So what my own work regarding rational rationality or what scholars are saying? So, so for you, what is rational? How, how are you responding to rational agency or rational autonomy rather? So I, 
I, I'm not denying that rationality plays a role in our lives, in our relationships, in the, in the political life. I'm just worried that it's always emphasized to the extent that it becomes kind of mandatory in that it mm. downplays all the other ways that we do relate to one another, that we create and decide other things. So I think it, in some ways it, it, it makes us more vulnerable because we're less... Uh, we have our, we pay less attention to all the different ways we can be influenced, for instance, all the ways we can be inspired. So rationality to me can be quite useful in having philosophical discussions for sure and making sure we are able to assess whether we truly uh, make these decisions, whether we truly like these things. Um, but it's a tool. It's a tool like any other tool. And sometimes we're, it's not really necessary, it's not required, and it, it should not demean uh, the claims of those who don't have access to these tools, who also are entitled to me to live their own life because their life belongs to them. Now, when let's say an animal's life belongs to them, and as you rightfully mentioned at the beginning, several animals are kind of born into lives of dependency. Uh, they are dependent on us, whether as companion animals to feed them and to house them. Uh, and even, even the animals that we have in our factory farms, uh, they're still dependent on us to look after them while in those factory farms. And even once liberated uh, and, and found in you know, sanctuaries, they still remain dependent on humans to some extent. So how do we, and this is now obviously speaking about uh, domesticated animals, you know, wild animals have, there's obviously a tension here in terms of thinking about wild animals and autonomy and domestic animals and autonomy. But just thinking about domestic animals and autonomy, how, how do you think through ideas of maybe paternalism here? Because if they are my ward and they are someone I have to look after, then they will follow my rules, for example. Mm -hmm. How do we deal with those tensions of autonomy and and care work versus paternalism? So you mentioned dependency. That's really an issue that is quite discussed within disability studies and as well as the ethics of care. So the first thing, what they're trying to, the argument they're making is that we tend to only see dependency in one way towards some more vulnerable people in our societies, whereas dependency is in fact a fact of life of all of us. So we're mm. all dependent on one another. So instead of speaking about dependency, they prefer to talk about interdependency. So just to to realize that even for people that we take to be autonomous, it's in fact, there's a whole social support behind us, mm -hmm. making sure we are able to follow the life that we want. So the society has been designed on purpose for enabling some of us to be fully autonomous. But we're not doing the same for other groups of people, for instance, because they're less aware, less, less capable of uh, making political claims or they have less power in their hands. So they're in a much more vulnerable situation. So they depend on very specific individuals, for instance, and they're not really able to contest that relationship. They don't, don't have anyone else to turn to. So I guess a way to kind of uh, balance a little bit more this kind of imbalance of power would be to have other safeguards of other people who would see what kind of power relationships exist mm -hmm. within different groups of societies. So we have people who would visit different people and assess what's happening and we'll pay attention to people uh, who are showing signs of uh, they're complaining about their situation, for instance. Or uh, there's also an issue I had devoted an entire chapter in my thesis about adaptive preferences, because sometimes people will just, all of us, we will develop genuine preferences, de genuine uh, desires to stay in a relationship where, in fact, we're quite vulnerable. Mm. That's a really tricky question, and I don't have uh, very perfect solutions to this. But at least I think most of the time, part of the solution is to slowly propose new options to open up the possible things that people can do in those situations. For instance, meeting other people, relying on other people as well, not just relying on specific people. Yeah, That's really, you raised a lot of uh, interesting ideas there. 
firstly, straight out of the bat, uh, straight out of the bat, I always say the wrong words, straight out of the, I don't know what the thing is, <laughs> but straight away, um, when you mentioned interdependency, because I drew this dichotomy between domesticated animals and wild animals, mm -hmm. and arguably one could say that wild animals are interdependent too. Uh, it just so happens that they happen often to be independent of humans. So that's not to now say that they are autonomous. They've just created different interdependencies, uh, you know, amongst one another in, in animal nations and animal spaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, which and is they really... also depend on their physical environment. And they don't have, if they don't have a, a, a healthful environment, it's very difficult for them to to sustain, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's obviously something that we impact. We impact mm -hmm. their ability to to continue their lives, you know, through our, our choices, uh, you know, thinking about climate change and pollution. But then in also saying that we are dependent ourselves, that we are all dependent in some way on our geography, on the infrastructure, that we have been enabled differently. Some people's environments have been more enable, enabling uh, based on, uh, ideas of what norm what the normal is right if if you happen mm -hmm. to fall in whatever the bracket of normal is your environment tends to be made a lot easier for you uh, so that's a really provocative idea uh, do you use at all in your thinking about autonomy you know because this makes me think about relationality which is a very key feminist idea do you use yeah. feminist thinkers in thinking through autonomy too Yes, absolutely. So feminists have proposed a different version of autonomy that have they have defined it as relational autonomy. So they're trying to uh, invite our attention that autonomy is not just about an individual, it's also about the whole social environment surrounding that individual that support or deprive that individual of the power to decide for herself. So the exact relational autonomy has been quite discussed by, for instance, Natalie Stolja, Katriana McKenzie, if I remember, um, and other disability scholars such as uh, Laura Devi. Yeah. Could you possibly give me an example of an animal in relation where you could see your changing idea of autonomy being put to use? How do you envision the future of thinking about animals' right to autonomy? Um, well, for sure, I'm, as any animal scholar, I'm really concerned about the current state of our relationship with them because it's a one-way relationship most of the time, at least for most of the animals who are just exploited in the industry in so many ways. Um, so I think when we start raising the question of autonomy, it invites people to have a different conception of what an animal is. An animal is not just a being who's there for us. It's not just a being who's suffering, so we should find ways, we should try to find ways to diminish their suffering. It's also a person or a being who has something to say, has something to live, mm. uh, that might be interested in something different than what we're proposing. So it's easier when we turn our discussion about autonomy to see them as unique individuals, because it's not just about suffering, it's about having personal preferences. And they're not all the same, they don't have all the same personality. So in this case, we're forced to see them as individuals who might choose different things and invite us to see our responsibilities towards them, not just as preventing them from suffering, but as offering them other uh, possible possibilities that they're faced with. And, um, and if we speak, if we are interested in companion animals in particular, I think it would also change a lot of things as well. So for now, I think because we're in a state of war, where animals are barely have the right to exist outside of private homes or perhaps on the dog parks. So it's, at the current state, it's difficult to to just say that let just the, decide because we would need to change so many things around the whole society because that's part of what autonomy is. It's not just about letting people decide. It's also about reframing the whole society so that we have better options that suit most people. Well, so this is this is interesting because I, I think that this raises some legal ideas. When you think about companion animals like dogs or cats, they've had over time very different relationships uh, with us and they've been legislated differently, I think, too, depending on the, the country you're looking at. So, for example, you think of horses. They're a very easy example where they were 
they were work animals and they continue to be work animals in several spaces, right? Uh, police horses, for example. But they were also visible. And this was something Siobhan brought up in a previous episode was the visibility of animals plays a role in how we legislate for them, how we think about what their needs are, as well as how they fit within, well, not even fit within our society, how we could create a society together. So, you know, historically, a lot of dogs and cats were not confined to people's homes. There's lovely stories of dogs that had you know, chosen humans in essence. Yes, they had met yeah. humans on the road and they would run to schoolyards, you know, to be a little boy or a little girl. And there would often be like dogs sitting outside the schoolyards waiting for the children to finish school and then walking home with them. But not like it wasn't a fixed set of home. It was kind of these dogs had lives of their own. And when they chose to join people, uh, they did, which is really beautiful uh, in its own Way. Yeah, I do agree, yeah. But then it raises a whole bunch of really practical concerns, uh, you know, about how animals could be in our cities, how we could imagine our cities differently. So, yes, it's part... Uh, so the, the, the picture you just um, proposed, yes, is probably some kind of... Uh, it would, the ideas I'm proposing would probably lead in that direction. But at the same time, we should also uh, take the collective responsibility of designing better our societies so that mm. they are safer and they have more interesting options. Um, yes, definitely. Um, and I do like the idea that... So currently, animals, especially in the law, uh, they're things, but when they're, we're starting to see them differently, they remain under custody. They remain kind of as permanent children in some ways, mm. uh, even though I really... I, I do find that our relationship with children is already morally problematic in many ways, but it's as if they're not allowed to grow, to grow up and to eventually perhaps leave or to pay a visit for a week or two to a neighbor and come back later. It's not really possible within our legal framework and our physical or urban framework as well, mm. because we really see animals as both belonging to a specific family that they have they didn't have chosen as well. Well, and and the law currently would, would, would seize them, right? Depending on mm -hmm. the country, if if you had a dog or a cat that was roaming around the streets by themselves, uh, without a tag, for example, this is another way in which the law starts to curtail, you know, surveil surveillance of of different animals and where they are. And there's it's a very difficult question. So I'm a new I'm a new human to a dog that was adopted, mm -hmm. and it raises some really difficult questions because you want to protect this being who you care and love. Uh, you want to give them agency and you go through a whole array of uh, you know, training and trying to teach them to be the best dog they can be. But you're right, there's no point at which he will ever not be under my control, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's a really difficult question to contend with. That's perhaps the best we can do in our current situation because I also believe uh, they are kind of uh, as refugees at the moment. If they are not at the right place at the right time, they will be seized. They will be perhaps be uh, killed uh, if nobody claimed them. Yeah. So they're really in the, in the danger of life, uh, of, of, of dying. Uh, so perhaps the best we can do sometimes is just caring for them at the moment. But eventually, we we'll shift uh, a lot of things in our society to so make sure they're as well able to manage things differently. Wow! Yeah, it's 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 profound when you start hanging out with animals and you start to see them as individuals with individual wants and uh, preferences and choices. Right? You've mm -hmm. given several toys. You will see an animal choose one of the other and refuse food uh, or or pick particular friends in the park. There's a, a really lovely um, book. I forget her full name, Rose Rosamond. Um, she looks at, I'll put it in the, the links. Um, she writes a book about the life of cows and she's actually a farmer herself, but she writes this beautiful story about how cows clearly have different friends. They will hang out yeah. with different cows and they will make choices about who they are with and when you start to realize i think that animals do make choices um how they make those choices seems 
irrelevant, maybe. Exactly. It's not really how they make the choices. It's, I would say it's to what extent these choices are important to them. I think they, they are. They're really important to their well-being. And what, also, what's the origin of their preferences? Because mm. in a situation of domination, it's easy to develop uh, things such as uh, the Stockholm Syndrome. Mm. or uh, to just be habituated to your own suboptimal situation. And the idea is not to just uh, deny the importance of these preferences, but to find ways to slowly open up the possibility so that people can revise their preferences if they were not really do the best one for them. That's, yeah, that's really, again, it's really hard, especially with some animals that we've got you know, I think dogs, it's a 15,000 year relationship, right? Um, mm -hmm. Where I think we've, you're 100% you're correct. There's definitely a power dynamic, a, a, a domineering presence, but it's not the same everywhere in all places in the world. Uh, so there are, there, there is room for reimagining and it's really exciting that you are thinking through some of these, these really difficult questions. Uh, perhaps now we can turn, I know... Is there, I've kind of really struggled. I'm like, I'm finding autonomy is so hard. It raises so many tensions because maybe that's why I asked the question about free will in the beginning is because I think I struggle a little bit. But like you said, that's metaphysical. I struggle a little bit with the idea of, of freedom or of autonomy um, or of the ability to make a choice because it's always in relation with something else it's always in tension with something else um mm -hmm. yeah it's really it's really hard so you put forward the idea of relational autonomy in your thesis is that correct yes exactly and this is what you were talking about earlier and how it relates to feminist ideas of relationality exactly that uh relationships around us can sometimes support our decision making, our autonomy, and sometimes hinder it. Mm -hmm. So we do need to pay attention. If we're talking about the autonomy of a specific individual, we cannot do it without speaking about the whole social environment as well. It's part of the discussion. Yeah. So it's more inclusive. It's more. It's, it's more... more complex that we should pay attention to all sources of influence towards one person's preferences because it's so easy to have adaptive preferences. So I think one of the reasons uh, a lot of feminists were driven to that question is because in within patriarchy, uh, some women uh, develop the genuine preference to... Um, to serve, to care for their husband and to stay within relationships where they don't have a lot of power. So a lot of feminists struggle to find ways to those concerns or those values that those women are important, they are genuine, even mm. though they come in tension with the overall goal of equality between men and women. Mm. 100, 100%, yes. There are great papers about this topic, a very complicated one, yeah. And... Uh... I mean, I'm not a legal scholar myself, so it's, it's kind of interesting that you and I are having a conversation about <laughs> law um, because it's the way in which I've come to understand law is that law is a relatively slow moving, you know, it's a relatively slow moving um, practice and process. So the kinds of changes you're suggesting here might take a long time to, to come to fruition. Do you think that the law is the place where this conversation needs to happen? Or do you think there are other spaces where this kind of autonomy could be realized? Um, I'm really open to have, to use all kinds of ways we can find to to further the uh, animal rights. Uh, in any ways we can bring more light to what individuals they are and what they want. So the legal way, even though I do agree, it's probably not for tomorrow. Uh, if we do have occasions to bring that up, I think that would be great. For instance, I can easily see in the uh, short future that when judges have to decide after a divorce who the dog or the cat or the mm -hmm. com animal companion is going to end up. So now they're starting to have the discussion in terms of what is the best interest of that specific animal companion. Perhaps we could also add into that discussion, what does that animal want? Who mm. they would like to prefer to live with? That's also part of our idea of what's the best interest for that animal, not only who's going to be able the best to care to 
uh, go around for a walk uh, once in a while, especially for dogs, but also who the dogs enjoy the most. Yeah, who they have the most, uh, the more uh, precious relationship with. That's an of, excellent example. So mm -hmm. it's also about how we ask the questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Towards where we're approaching uh, just over 40 minutes now. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about, I know you've got a quote ready and normally, normally folks don't send me the quote beforehand, but uh, you did. So I have had a sneak peek. Uh, do you want to go ahead and tell us who your, who your quote is by and um, then give us a, give it a read. Yes, with pleasure. So I've chosen a quote by, uh, it's a feminist legal scholar, pretty uh, famous, uh, as far as I know. Uh, mm -hmm. She is Catherine McKinnon. Uh, she wrote uh, at least one paper about animal uh, rights. It's called Of Mice and Men, a Feminist Fragment on Animal Rights. And as I recall, she's not trying to propose anything definitive. She's just raising a couple of ideas, trying, trying to make, uh, to draw connections between the feminist issue and the animal issue. And there's a, one paragraph that I thought, I thought was particularly interesting. So I'm going to read it. Just as our solution is ours, their solution has to be theirs. This recognition places at the core of the problem of animal rights a specific speaking of the, for the other problem. What is called animal law has been human law. The laws of humans on, or, for, or about animals. These are laws about humans' relations to animals. Who asked the animals? Ref references to what animals might have to say are few and far between. Do animals dissent from human hegemony? I think they often do. They vote with their feet by running away. They bite back, scream in alarm, withhold affection, approach warily, fly, and swim off. And I thought it was quite interesting to raise that question, even though she's only talking about in what ways animals can dissent mm -hmm. our power over them. And I think we should also include in the same discussion, what do they consent to and what do they propose? Because they're also asking us a couple of things, they are suggesting things that we can build with us. So it goes both ways, definitely. That's it's it's a great it's a great quote and that whole idea of vote with your feet uh, you know if we start to pay attention what is it that they are saying and so often I can't recall if it's come up in a in one of the episodes now in this season but so often we speak about how animals actually are pretty clear with what their wants are what their needs are they as long as you've have some sort of i think relation with the animal and you have an understanding of how they express themselves using their bodies uh that it's it starts to become increasingly clear whether or not they are saying that this is something they enjoy or this is something that they don't right that the act of closing your eyes when you're getting a belly rub or uh you know that's that's a pretty clear indicator of of pleasure yes there are sometimes i think they're a great model of how life can be more simple even for us and there's also another dimension I wanted to raise about the, the quote I chose is mm -hmm. uh, especially because here we're in a season about uh, in your podcast about animal law. Mm -hmm. So in that quote, she also raises the fact that so far, the law that we have about animals are made for humans. It's, it's to serve the interest of the humans. And what, what a law that is interested in what the animals want, what is good for them, if we were include them in writing a different law, how would it look like? I have, don't have a lot of ideas about it because we need to ask them, the animals themselves, what kind of law do they want, they want to have with us about them? Yeah, yeah, it's an exceptional question to, to think through. I think both Will and Leslie uh, in, in episode one and two brought up this idea that the law is actually a law about humans. So Leslie, she, she opened up an animal law practice and found herself actually having to reach animals through humans and their relations with mm -hmm. animals. Uh, and something we touched on briefly then was also considering how this has changed too. Historically, animals used to be pulled into courtrooms and, you know, been they were told to admit to guilt somehow and to, mm -hmm. to express, to understand whether they were showing any sort of remorse for what they did. And to some of us now, that might seem completely ludicrous. How how can you tell, you know, like it seems crazy, the idea of dragging an animal into a courtroom mm -hmm. uh, and probably very frightening and scary for the animal. 
But in a weird way, there was also historically an admission there that the animal might have known what they were doing. Uh, whereas today, I think there is no such thinking that, that the animal had any idea. I think most of the time they're just assumed to have been uh, not thinking at all. And whether or not they had something to say, it's like we're not even interested in their own perspective. Mm -hmm. Why did they behave in that specific way? For sure. And what, what kind of needs they were trying to fulfill? Yeah, and I think an interesting way to think about that too is when you think about human-animal conflict. So the spaces in which humans and animals find themselves competing for the same resources mm -hmm. and uh, animals end up hurting humans. And then to, and then oftentimes, unfortunately, the animal ends up dead, ends up killed for, for their resistance or for asserting their authority over their territory. And again, if it starts to raise questions about what would it mean if we were to consider what they are saying with seriousness about the, their space and their autonomy and desire and want for their space. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're try they're telling us something that is really important to them, and it's kind of we're all waiting uh, the advantage. If we need something, it's then therefore humans should have it. It's as if we're not really interested in looking for alternatives or something that would be a win-win situation. Yeah, it's it's. I, I know in in Botswana it was really interesting because this was. There's a lot of human-animal conflict with elephants, and elephants would often come over and unfortunately destroy a lot of crops, and these crops are very much needed for the farmers in the area, and a lot of tensions were coming, uh, you know, farmers were losing crops and, and elephants were getting hurt or killed, and it ended up being such a simple solution to to you know, to just looking at what elephants don't like and what they do like and trying to create a space that signaled to the elephants that this wasn't a place for them and it ended up being bees bees were you know a single a simple fence with some beehives and elephants don't like the sound of bees so they so they respected those territories of course then the question then becomes at what point do we respect their signals that we've gone too far into their space mm -hmm. exactly well, Frederick, it's been such a great conversation. Sorry for my random ramblings. I think I, I struggled a little bit with, with thinking through autonomy. Um, like I said at the beginning, it seems easy, but it's quite complicated. Are you still doing work on autonomy now? Uh, yes, I hope to continue the, this research. I'm not sure to, in what direction. I think perhaps in the same way that I included not only you know, human animals and um, persons with cognitive disabilities, I'm also more and more interested in including children in the discussion as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but whether perhaps find ways to publish a book about it or find ways to help other people research, um, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> so if people want to get in touch with you about the work you're doing or to maybe ask a question about autonomy, um, yeah. how, could they, how could they find you? Yes, if they Google my name, they will find uh, my website. There's a place to contact me or uh, yeah, so you, perhaps you could also link it in the podcast description. I'm already open to that for sure. Sure, 100%. <laughs> well, thank you so much for a wonderful chat. It's been great talking to you. And I hope that once uh, once lockdown, or oh, we're not in lockdown, sorry, I've got my South Africa hat on. Uh, once once COVID-19 eases up a bit, um, that maybe we'll get to meet. I still haven't been to Montreal, so I hope to I hope to yes. one day visit. Yeah, it will be a great pleasure for me too, to meet you. Thank you for Claudia, and I hope it's going to help you for our reflections about animals and the law. <laughs> it definitely has. Thanks so okay. much, Frederick. Bye. 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 Thank you to Frederic for joining me today. And thank you, as always, to Jeremy John for the logo, Gordon Clark for the bed music, and Animals in Philosophy, Politics, Law, and Ethics, Apple, for sponsoring this podcast. Next episode, I speak to Valerie Giroux about our next concept, liberty. I hope you'll join me then. In the meantime, you're welcome to connect with me on Twitter. My handle is Claudia F. Town. That's Claudia F. T. O. W. N. E. This is The Animal Turn with me, Claudia F. Town.
that. For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D.com. Oh.